So that's how we worked for four books. We'd finish a book, I'd get it out to them. They'd say, fantastic. We'll put it on the schedule and you'll see it a year from now, which got a little bit frustrating. It's like, mm, boy, that's a long time to wait while I write the next one. So I didn't care for that. I wasn't wild about the covers as we went along. I liked the first cover, but it got kind of cartoony after that. And they were having trouble marketing the book. It's a comic mystery about a, a magician who ends up being a detective. It's a male protagonist uh, written by a male author, sort of a quirky little path to go down. And uh, after four books, I could sense their frustration. I could see the uh, the numbers that were that they were giving me, uh, you know, quarterly. They weren't great, and I thought they could be better. And I just did some math and went. Here's a number. If I give you this much money, can I walk away with my book? Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 218 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with John Gaspard. He's the author of the Eli Marks Mystery Series, four standalone novels, as well as the Como Lake Players Mystery Series under the pen name Bobby Raymond. Now, in real life, John writes about, but is not a magician. But he has directed six low-budget features that cost very little and made even less, and that's no small trick. He's also written multiple books on the subject of low-budget filmmaking, and ironically, he says, they've made more than the films. So, it's a fantastic interview with John about his journey through traditional publishing, his decision to go indie, filmmaking, uh, writing about magicians, some of the marketing uh, strategies he's employed. It's a lot of fun, you're going to enjoy it, and it's coming up later in this episode. First... Let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Now, Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you, the indie author, to get your books out into the global market. They have more than 43 retail and library systems that you can distribute to. And what I love about it is you have choice. You can decide which platforms you want to use them for. So you can use them for some, you can use them for all, you decide you go through and click them all or decide how you're going to do it. And that's what I love about Findaway. There's more choices, more options for authors. If you're looking for a professional narrator, they have a curated process where they assign a project manager to help find and narrow down from thousands of narrators in their, in their, in their bucket. Uh, it's larger than a bucket. It's the international network, I guess I should call it. <laughs> And they'll find between five and ten narrators uh, from from different price ranges just to see, to see if those would be worthwhile working with. And they very soon, very shortly, are launching Marketplace where, very similar to ACX, there can be audio professionals who basically hang their shingle, post, and then you can sort through there to try to find people that you think may be good. So you have a choice. You can go through the project manage system, you can find your own narrator, or if you have your own audiobook all ready to go, you can just upload it to Findaway Voices and decide how and where, and all those things. They also have access to additional promotional opportunities, particularly with Chirp, which is owned by BookBub, and other promotional opportunities. Now, if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author and take control of your audiobook empire, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Just going to quickly do one comment. So this is a comment from Twitter. It came from Edwin uh, Downward, and it's uh, about, uh, episode 217 where I was talking to Sarah Cadiz and uh, Adrian Kerr. Now, the uh, Edwin said, uh, caught the bonus Stark Reflections podcast with Mark Leslie and must reflect on his closing comment. 
I have to pause for a second and say, I love when listeners reflect on the reflections. That's what it's all about. Anyways, uh, so I must reflect on his closing comments about the right editor. I went back to my evil content editor because she's so mean, she makes me think about areas she has trouble with, which invariably forces me to change things. Uh, in the in a Twitter exchange Edwin and I had, he then responded, it's not even necessary to agree with each comment that she makes, so long as I can come up with a thoughtful reason why I'm rejecting it, or going off on a tangent neither of us saw. Yes, yes, exactly. The right editor doesn't mean that everything they tell you is, is you're going to do everything they say. You are going to discriminate. You're going to take a look at what they what they're suggesting and they're just suggestions ultimately you are the author you're in charge of this so that's a phenomenal thing that i think writers need to recognize is yes it's good to have a great editor and it's good to have these conversations but that's what it is it's a negotiation it's a conversation so edwin thank you so much for leaving that comment and that reflection so if you want to share your own reflections, you can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca for any episode. I do welcome uh, reflections from my listeners because the whole point of this podcast, and Edwin gets it, obviously, is I'm reflecting on the things that I've learned. But just because I come up with some conclusion or something that I think is going to work for me doesn't necessarily mean that's going to work for you. You will hear the same thing I hear, the same interview, and, and maybe you'll reflect about something differently. And that's that's the joy, just kind of like working with an editor and deciding which of the things are going to work and which are probably not going to work. And that's what it's all about. You can also reflect uh, at me on Twitter over at Mark Leslie or email me, mark at marklesley.ca. I do relish those reflections because every reflection that I hear from you listeners there are things that help me learn. And if I can share them back, uh, then the whole community can learn. And we're all learning. Yay, it's a big learning, loving, that kind of thing. Anyway, that's it for comments. Let's move on to a quick personal update. Okay, uh, the deadline for the rewrites, etc. for the next book in the Canadian Werewolf series, Fright Night's Big City. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, oh my God. <laughs> I, I'm doing it to myself again, deadline-wise. Because I really want to get this finished by, um, I, I was hoping to get it finished by early November uh, to get it to Scott Overton, my narrator. But I know that the audiobook's probably going to be delayed because I'm not going to probably have those final edits done until the middle of, of November. And so that doesn't give Scott very long because the book launches December 7th. Uh, I'm already seeing uh, quite a number of pre-orders for it. So I'm pretty pleased that people actually want to continue to read books in the series. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, I have plans to write the next book or the next novella in this universe, which doesn't actually take place after Fright Night's Big City. It goes back to before the very first novel. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a fun project. Um, and I'll be working on that uh, through November, uh, early uh, December as well with my awesome co-author, which I'll talk about in a few future episode. Maybe we'll even talk about this whole process and why I'm doing this other novella in that in that universe. But yeah, everything, it's uh, the 29th of October as I'm recording this. I am actually a little bit behind in, in recording the intro-outro. Um, it's just been a crazy week. At draft to digital we launched finally after rolling it in and out of staging and had to refix things for a while. Print UBLs, Universal Book Links. So, for example, if you go to bookstoread.com slash haunted hospitals, you'll see one of my traditionally published books with links to uh, normally just the ebook because there is no audiobook. But soon I'll be able to add, or now I can add, and I think I already have added, print book links. So, when you go to bookstoread.com slash haunted hospitals, you can see links for different retailers, um, online ebook stores, but then, then you can now also see links to where you can get it in paperback. And so um, it's what print links are for universal book links or books to read is basically you can add paperback, hardcover, and a large print. So for example, if you go to books to read.com slash the relaxed author, late last book I released with Joanna Penn, that is available in hardcover, trade paperback, and large print. So you'll have links to all of those at numerous stores. You have links to the audiobook. You have links to the ebook. 
So it is truly universal. Now that has been taking quite a bit of time, quite a bit of testing, quite a bit of work with the development team and more exciting things because even this week, even though we launched that into production, I'm on stage testing enhanced analytics where uh, rather than just showing you the top three stores that were clicked, actually giving you more detailed analytics so you can sort and see time frames and stuff like that. So that's really exciting. Lots of things going on there, keeping me busy. And then I'm getting ready to do my travel again. Next week, I am heading off to, I'm flying out on Friday uh, next week to go to New Jersey, where I'm doing a two-hour keynote for Liberty State Writers. There's a conference there. I'm flying into Newark. Uh, they're picking me up. It's uh, probably about a 40-minute drive south of Newark in New Jersey. Um, I think it's called Clark is the town. And yeah, I'm doing a two-hour keynote at the end of the day, which is basically, um, there's never been a better time to be a writer, and I kind of walk through my journey as a writer, uh, as well as talk about all of the amazing opportunities that exist, not just in ebooks, but throughout the creative, um, the, the creative communities, throughout all of the platforms that are accessible. It's very much a wide discussion of how writers can leverage traditional publishing, indie publishing, and places in between for success. So I'm excited about that. And then immediately following that, it's a one day conference. I hop on a plane uh, on Sunday and I fly to Vegas for 20 books of Vegas. Uh, I am on a panel talking about Apple Books with Diane Capri, Cheryl Bradshaw, and I'm doing a talk on Wide for the Win. Uh, and then another talk on, called Killing It on Kobo. Yes, they're both based on books I have written. So that's going to be fun. And I'm so looking forward to getting to see so many awesome people. It's um, It's been fun. I, I the, the only crowd that I've been in lately since the pandemic, because uh, we're still locked down here in Ontario with um, can't get into places without showing that you're double vaxxed and still have to wear masks inside. Uh, Liz and I went to the Rocky Horror Picture Show at Princess Cinema in Uptown Waterloo the other night. And it was uh, the first time we were in, in a room with so many people. And again, there was a mask mandate. Of course, you take your mask off and you're eating your popcorn or, or whatever. But it was um, it was fun. It, it was um, a little bit, a little, I was a little bit nervous. But I think that helped me because I, you know, when I, when I, I'm going to be go on a plane, I'm going to be surrounded by lots of people uh, coming uh, soon. So yeah, it, 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 you got to acclimatize yourself to these conditions because, come on, it's been more than 18 months that, you know, Liz is the only person, uh, maybe Liz, uh, my son Alexander, uh, her kids, and my mom, uh, you know, very few people that I've actually uh, hung around with, uh, cl gotten close to, like physically within six feet of uh, for a long time. So it's going to be, it's going to be strange, especially because I'm a hugger. How am I going to do that? And I know, I know that COVID can't be transmitted with hugs, so, <laughs> right? Because Everyone has a mask on. We should be fine. But anyways, uh, it's going to be interesting, to say the least. But that's it for my personal update and the blather at the beginning of the episode. Let's get into this conversation with John Gaspard. Hey, John. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Hey, Mark. It's great. Great to be on the podcast. I've really enjoyed listening to it and learned uh, quite a bit from your travails and travels. Oh, oh <laughs> thank you. I... Uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, as we were chatting, I was like, oh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about that. Um, but I always like to start at the beginning. But, but one of the things we, we chatted about earlier was you were originally traditionally published and then you managed to acquire your rights back. Can you get into a, a few of the details of, of what was that journey to traditional publishing and then how was the journey to indie publishing? Sure. I'll, I'll try to do the short version of it. Um, I did have to sign an NDA, which I thought was sort of weird. Uh, to get my rights back. Um, so I won't use any names or anything. Um, no, that's good. But we're just getting the gist of it. But I like that. Yeah. So an NDA was obviously part of the process. So that's good for authors to understand. Yeah, that came up. Um, my my process to being traditionally published is so similar to other people's that it'll sound like a repeat in that I had an idea for a novel. I wrote it. I banged it around for years, finding an agent, finally got an agent. She shopped around for a couple of years. Nothing happened. A very traditional route. Uh, and then I started the Eli Marks series with the first book called The Ambitious Card. So Eli and Marks was with this publisher then? Nope. We, at this point, we have no publisher. We have a very nice agent out of New York. She was a little sweet woman. Uh, did the best she could with this first standalone novel, which was a thing about 
Jack the Ripper. Uh, but after, you know, like four years of work, kind of went, you know, it's just not going anywhere. Okay. Um, and I'd started writing the first Eli Marks book. And rather than take it to her, who was going on a maternity leave, um, I started shopping it around myself to publishers, uh, looking uh, looking for publishers that seem to have that that the same sense of humor that the book had. And I w- was just reading through Mystery Scene magazine one day, like you do, looking at reviews, and someone was reviewing a book. It didn't sound, it wasn't my book, but the tone of the book, I went, oh, that publisher, whoever published that would get this book. Okay. So I sent it, uh, sent them a query email. Uh, I got an email back a couple days later that said, please send in your MS which I looked up and means manuscript. Uh, we've got a big stack here, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, that was on a Friday and a Monday, I got a phone call saying, yeah, we want to do this book, Wow! which was, yeah, that's nice. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's the lightning strike said, after years of work with an agent. It really is. It really <laughs> is. Um, and then uh, she said, and we'd like to do a contract for three more. And I said, no, thank you. Um, and the reason I said, no, thank you was, um, uh, at the time, I was making my living as a writer and a video producer. I was doing a lot of writing. Okay. Uh, writing novels was a hobby. It still is. It's supposed to well, be well, Wait a second. What were you writing then? Uh, we'll, we'll get into that next, I we'll guess. We'll get into that. Okay. So I said, um, I'm happy to, I'm going to write more of these. Uh, you have, you know, first writer refusal in each one of them, but I'm not going to be contracted. I'm not going to be told I have to have you a book by a particular date because then it's just no longer a hobby. Then it's a, I already have a job. I don't need another job. <laughs> so that's how we worked for four books. Uh, I would finish a book. Uh, I'd get it out to them. They'd say, fantastic. Uh, we'll put it on the schedule and you'll see it a year from now, which got a little bit frustrating. It's like, mm, boy, that's a long time to wait while I write the next one. So I didn't care for that. Um, I wasn't wild about the covers as we went along. I liked the first cover, but it got kind of cartoony after that. And they were having trouble. They'd be the first to admit marketing the book. It's a, right. it's a comic mystery about a, a magician who ends up being a detective. It's a male protagonist uh, written by a male author, uh, sort of a quirky little path to go down. And uh, after four books, I could sense their frustration. I could see the, uh, the numbers that, were, that they were giving me uh, you know, quarterly. Uh, they weren't great. And I thought they could be better. And I just did some math and went, here's a number. If I give you this much money, can I walk away with my books? And uh, they said yes, because they needed, uh, I think, a little infusion at that point. Oh, and well, 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 can I, I, I could pause. You're, 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 no, my audience, I'm, I'm feeling for them because there's first a question I want to ask, but I want to get sure. in. Sure, go for it. Money. Um, could you please explain for my listeners what a right of first refusal is? Sure. Um, that's, it's exactly what it sounds like. If you, the next book, you have to give it to them and they have the first right of refusal. If they don't want it, you can then shop it around. But you know, if you've done book one of the Eli Marks mystery series, they want to make sure they can publish book two. Right. They don't want it going somewhere else because as I learned, um, uh, 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 you live and die on a series, yeah. which is unfortunate, but it's just a fact. If right. you're going to make money in this business, you have to have a series. And um uh, they don't. They didn't want to lose the series. So each time I wrote a book in the series, the next book was they had the first choice to first chance of getting it. And they have the right to make an offer, and then you can still refuse that offer if you wanted to, right? That. Uh, yes, I think I think you could. Okay. I never did. Um, okay. I when it came time to, I was working on the fifth book when they had the fourth book, and I said I have another book coming out. I don't think you guys want it. Right. And they said, Yeah, we're not doing great here. I don't think we'll take another one. So, so that's when so, I knew yeah. I could buy back the rights. And and this is this is something that's fascinating to me because it sounded like the series was not doing as well with them as everyone had thought. Everyone had good mm-hmm. hopes for it, you and, and them. Yeah. Um, but normally what, what I've seen happen is is it's not selling so well and you're like, I think I'd like to go out on my own and try this or do something else with it. Um, yeah. But you did a, a, a bolder business move, figured out I'm going to I'm going to offer you money. <laughs> So what? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a, as I mentioned there was an NDA, so I can't say a lot. Yeah. I sensed that the only way I was going to get their attention, right. their serious attention right. was to say, I've run some numbers. Here's what I think you're going to make in the next two years. And I'm okay. being generous. Um, 
if I give you that, give me back the rights, and then we'll just shake hands and walk away. Uh, and I mean, that's demonstrating your professionalism, your integrity. Like, I, I really, I think that's that's fantastic. Well, that's true, but it's also demonstrating, um, you know, if you've been around for a while, you run into difficult people. Yeah. And you recognize um, what's going to get you what you need, what what's going to annoy them, uh, and what's going to get them to say yes. And uh, I've had this conversation with other authors from the same publisher who wanted to do the same thing and, and just don't want to spend the money. It's right. like there's they there's no other words they're going to hear. Nothing else you're going to say is going to make them interested because that's the other, that's the way it's running. Right. So right. so that's what I did, and um, I. Uh, found a uh, a lovely uh, designer in England uh, at, a, at a group called Design for Writers, and he got it. He really understood what I needed. And right. about a month later, um, at that point, there were now six books. Um, brand new covers existed for all six books. I had bought vellum. I had redone everything, and I was up and running about a month later, right. and immediately make immediately making more than I'd made with them simply because they weren't there. I wasn't sharing anything with anybody. Right, right. Um, and you were probably selling a lot more digitally uh, than... I think I think so. Yeah. I think I was. Uh, well, I think uh, they also weren't in Kindle Unlimited at the time. And right. I went into that, uh, which is a... I, I, don't, I don't do it now, but at the time was a really good way to get my, my feet wet. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, and again, you only have to focus on one platform at the time yep. too, the world's yeah. biggest bookstore. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mean to derail because of this great story, but I was like, no, 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 there's no questions here. I, if I have them, I'm sure the audience does. Yeah. I, I knew writer first refusal, but I wanted I wanted to share that with the audience uh, from, from your experience with the contract. Now, you said you were making full-time income as a writer. So this writing novels was a hobby. What writing was it you're talking about? I was writing... Um scripts and proposals and things for um i worked for a company that produced meetings and events for other big companies fortune 500 companies okay so i was writing video scripts i was producing videos um for many many years i'd also written screenplays on the side i'd sold a couple tv things i'd made a few low budget movies from my oh, own just, scripts. just sold a couple tv things some low budget movies nothing big well, <laughs> Come on. well oh, i didn't sell any low budget going, oh my god really he did this I, I made the low budget movies myself so that, you know, that you're, so I was already the buyer and I was predisposed to want to, to want to make it. <laughs> and, and oh my God, you loved your, your, your scripts. <laughs> um, mostly. Yeah, mostly. So I, you know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't really keen all the time on coming home and writing. If I had to, I did, you know, I would, it's, one, it's something I wanted to do, not had to do. Right. But on the other hand, uh, I wasn't never afraid to uh, a face the blank page because right. I faced a blank page every day. So I knew that process. <laughs> and because I'd made low budget movies, um, which sometimes would take up to a year or more to make, I was very used to working on projects that had a long timeline where I wouldn't get freaked out by the fact that there was so much stuff to do. Right. Everything is just done in discrete steps. And that's not unlike, you know, writing a screenplay. It's not unlike writing a novel. When you sit down and write a novel, if, if you have one of those programs that gives you the word count on it, it's like, oh, what, what, 500 words? And I've got to have 70,000. I'm going to do that. Well, you're going to do that eventually. You're not going to do that tomorrow. And that's what I learned from making movies. Okay. Wow. Um, let's talk about the difference between, I, I know it was, the movies was work. Uh, mm -hmm. that you're getting paid for and the novels was a hobby. It was something that you're doing for fun, but what about the difference in terms of the actual craft? I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is, well, movies are obviously a lot more dialogue, <laughs> but um, how, how did, how do the two work in terms okay. of how do you approach them? Do you approach them sure. differently? And, and did writing scripts actually help make you a better novelist? Um, yes. To the second one, I think. Uh, I just want to disabuse you of the idea that, that movies have more dialogue. Movies have less dialogue. There's less talking in movies than, than, than in most novels. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which is why when you're writing mysteries, uh, writing a mystery in a novel is so much easier because you can, you can bury a lot of red herrings. There's a lot of stuff you can add going around. When you're watching a, a mystery on TV, if you're watching, you know, like a six part something on Netflix right. and someone mentions in passing that Aunt Jane loves chocolate chip cookies. That's probably there for a reason. Um, you can't put in a ton of red herrings 
right. in a in a movie because you just don't have the time and things have to pay off. So when you're working on a novel, you got a much bigger playing field. You can add all kinds of, you know, you know, when you see a, a movie that's made from a book, you go, well, hey, they cut that whole character, they cut that whole subplot, they cut all that. Yeah, they right. had to, because okay. they're just in 120 minutes, there's just not time. So the the best thing I learned from uh writing low budget movies and shooting them and editing them and you know being intimately involved with the creation of each scene is the best way to get into a scene, which is as late as possible, and the best way to get out of the scene, which is as early as possible. And you also learn tricks for getting exposition out. Uh, when you need a character to know something, there's there's obvious ways that someone can tell them that. And if you if you watch any sort of law and order sort of show, there's always one cop who shows up at the crime scene and there's one who's already there and the one who's already there fills them in as what's going on. There's yeah, all your exposition. Always love those parts, right? He's yes. like, here, here's how we're going to tell you exactly. Exactly. Yep. I love that. Okay. <laughs> and in, in novels, you can be sneakier about that. Um, we can be sneakier about it in movies too, if you're good at it. Um, so it really really helped in the creation of scenes to have uh, written a lot of them, to have heard actors say them out loud, to have edited them and seen, oh my goodness, I don't really need those first three lines that she said. We can, let's start it right there. And it's a much punchier beginning. And as it turns out, those last two lines, now that I see them on the screen, it's much better if you cut them out. In fact, I was listening to an interview with Aaron Sorkin, recently and he talked about that very thing that he had read somewhere that um uh go through all of your scenes and cut out the last line and you're going to find they generally work better and it's true okay. for some reason we, we write that extra line uh and it's the really really good books and the really really good movies that have already cut that out and that's why they seem to just fly right along there's no dragging because they've just bared it down to exactly what it what it needs to be and and it's learning by doing was the best way for me to do that. So now when I sit down to write a scene in a book, um, I'm not necessarily starting at the beginning of the scene. I might jump in right in the middle. Um, I might have uh, someone that rather than jumping right at the beginning, it's, it's let's have a line of dialogue that opens it, that sort of sets things up. And then we can, we can backfill later just to try to make it as interesting as possible. And I, I learned that from doing it in movies. Wow. Wow, that is fascinating. I love that advice. Thank you so much. Um, can, can, let's the low budget films. So you wrote wrote them as well as produced them, or what? what yeah, the, what the, the 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 short version on that is uh, around age twelve. I had an uncle who gave me a wind up movie camera, <laughs> and I started shooting short movies with my friends, uh, which uh, is at the time was not uncommon. And you'd finish up your three minute twenty second film cartridge and you'd send it off to photo matter or whatever. And a week later, you get it back and look at it. And, and I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. They're really fun. Uh, and uh, I then graduated from that and uh, spent most of my high school years, every afternoon uh, while in high school at a, a film school here in the twin cities, it was an afternoon film program. And so you'd do your normal work at high school in the morning and then you get on a bus and be bused uh, from Minneapolis to St. Paul, where you uh, learned about filmmaking. And you made films and you made short films, and you made long films. During my high school career, I made two, well, yeah, I worked on two feature length uh, Super 8 sound movies, which was pretty unheard of at the time. Um, uh, technically, it was the equipment was very new and very buggy. Uh, but uh, with a friend of mine, uh, we produced two of those. I did another one uh, my first year in college. Uh, again on Super 8. And then because I was going to the University of Minnesota and they had equipment there, uh, we made a couple features that we wrote on what were called three quarter inch umatic cassettes, which is basically what they used for news back then. And these are big boxy cassettes um, <laughs> that they were throwing out. They would use them once and throw them away. So but we'd let them use them once and we'd take them and made our movies on that. And those are things that I either wrote or co-wrote. Flash forward a couple of years, I've been writing screenplays for a while at that point, trying to sell them. And a friend of mine came up and said, I have a screenplay. I have $30,000. I want to make a 16 millimeter, millimeter film. Would you direct it? So I did that for him. And then I said, you're a really good producer. I just sold a TV script. Uh, would you produce a script that a friend of mine and I wrote through? 
did two 16 millimeter feature films, each for around $30,000 back to back wow. in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, when a lot of people, there was a very big movement at that point. The movie Clerks uh, is probably the best example of that movement of uh, very low budget films uh, made very, 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 very cheaply uh, with 16 millimeter film. Wow. A couple of years go by, the DV craze begins uh, where you can now shoot forever uh, on DV tapes or DV cards. Because uh, back in the 16 millimeter days, uh, it was very expensive. Film was your biggest expense. Right. Uh, and I made three features using different kinds of uh, DV technology, uh, all stuff that I either wrote or co-wrote. And then I would sit down and produce them and edit them and in some cases shoot them as well. So I got really good at uh, of that world. It helped that I was also producing video during the day at my day job. So I had uh, not only experience every day doing that sort of stuff, but also got to know some of the best technical people in town. And the Twin Cities uh, has a fantastic acting community. So I was always able to work with really great actors. Oh my God, that's fantastic. So th thank you for filling me in on that background. I will just say, didn't make any money on them. Um, lost money on most of them. Uh, but I did write a couple nonfiction books on how to produce uh, low budget movies and those have made money so oh cool and they're um, still available and you'll give me links to them so we can... i will give you links to those yeah awesome <laughs> for for any listeners who are interested in how to do that so let's get back to uh you moved to you moved your book so this is the eli marks series and you yep. ended up moving that indie because you got vellum you figured out you got a great cover designer <laughs> and published them and 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 the, you made your back your investment uh, for for a while. Yeah, okay. pretty quickly. Uh, pretty quickly that the money that I spent to, to get them back, get the rights back and do the covers and all that uh, came back within a year. Uh, they were all doing pretty well at this point. All on Amazon, all on Amazon Kindle. Okay. Uh, I started a second series uh, that uh, was just an experiment to try doing a, a cozy mystery series with a female lead uh, with a female pen name just to see what happened there, uh, but was learning so much along the way that it just became easier and easier. And, and of course, once you make the investment into Vellum, which isn't a huge investment, but it is you know, a couple hundred bucks, uh, and you've got your covers, you can get books out pretty cheaply. Uh, right. it, it is not an expensive process to do. Uh, it's just a question of sitting down and doing it. Wow. Oh, that is cool. But you've also done something with the Eli Mark series in terms of innovative uh, marketing, innovative uh, strategy for sharing that. Can you talk a little bit about the behind the page? Uh, sure. Podcast? I, I will agree with you that it's innovative. I don't know if it's successful in the yeah, sense that we'll I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because it's relatively new. We've only been doing it since January. But um, early on in the in the process, about, about around book four, um, a friend of mine who is a professional voice talent here in the Twin Cities, and who was actually sort of the inspiration for me getting into writing a book about magicians, even though I'm not a magician, um, said, you know, there's a way to make your own audiobooks, and we should do that with the Eli Marks series. And so I looked into ACX, and um, at, the, at the time, the, the books were still with the publisher, but the contract did not say anything about audiobooks. So I informed them that I was going to do audiobooks of my own, and they said, well, no, we want to do them. And I said, well, sorry, it's not in the contract. So I'm going to do them. And by the way, you've shown an interest in doing them, doing audio books up to this point. It was only interest when I mentioned it. Uh, and so uh, my friend and I started recording the books and he's fantastic. I mean, he's a professional voice talent, but he's also a great actor. He gets the jokes. He absolutely understands the magic because he has a background in magic. And I always tell people to listen to the books, don't read them. Uh, I mean, go ahead and read them, but he does such a great job. Um, and so we recorded uh, all seven books uh, and then a couple short stories. And I was thinking toward the end of late, late last year, you know, it was middle of pandemic and kind of, I don't do a great job of planning ahead marketing wise, uh, certainly not to the degree that some people that I hear on podcasts do, but I was thinking, you know, um, when I was working in corporate America, uh, doing videos and meetings and events, I'd worked at a, uh, an event where the banking industry had gotten together and done a year-long study on the word free. And what does the word free mean? And how do customers look at the word free? And is that a good word or is it a bad word in their industry? And I thought, well, I know free is sort of a double-edged sword in the, in the book business. Uh, people give their book away for free and, you, and, and then someone 
reads the rest of the series, but you also have a whole subset of people who only go after free books and they'll take your book with nothing else happened. It. So it's sort of a, do you want to go down that path or not? But we had these seven books all recorded. And I thought, well, let's try an experiment. We'll do uh, a podcast and we'll do 24 episodes, one every, well, twice a month. And each episode will be the next chapter in a book. We'll do the first book, The Ambitious Card, and we'll give it away. Uh, there won't be any ads. There'll be, okay. it'll just be, you know, sign up, boom, every two weeks it appears on your podcast list. Okay. And in order to make it uh, a little different than that, let's talk to people uh, who can give us more information on what's happening in that chapter. For example, early on in The Ambitious Card, there's a th- throwaway mention of a magician from the turn of the century named Max Molini. It's just literally a throwaway mention that that is made. Um, so for that episode, we got an expert on Max Molini, a magician named Steve Cohen out of New York, who's written a book about Max. And for 20 minutes, he tells us everything you need to know about Max Molini so that when you hear the chapter, there's, he has a bit more depth to it. And right. that was sort of our, our plan for each episode. For example, there in, in all the books, uh, Eli Marks, who's in his 30s and is a professional magician, uh, has been raised by his uncle, his uncle Harry, who is a master magician and is in his 80s and has done every kind of magic show everywhere in the world and knows everybody. And he has a bunch of friends, a bunch of cronies who are also old magicians and variety artists who he hangs out at, at a bar next to their magic shop. And so we wanted to talk before that chapter about what were these old magicians really like? And one of the oddly enough, one of the experts on that is Dick Cavett, who in his talk show in the 70s and 80s uh, interviewed just about every top old magician of the time who had come out of vaudeville and that sort of thing, guys like Slidini um, and uh, Di Vernon and uh, Jay Marshall, all, all these names that would mean a lot to magicians, but not to the average person. And so Dick Cavett came on and for two episodes, he just talked about his experiences in magic and uh, what these old guys were like and what he learned from them. So the, you know, each episode runs about an hour. So you got about a 20, 25 minute interview and then you got a half hour of the book and then we tell you who's coming up next and you move on. And the response has been very, very good. I, uh, I don't know the exact numbers of downloads but I do know I'm getting emails from people in Switzerland and England and all over the place. And currently the audio books are selling more. Now, I was going to ask that. Is was, that necessarily because of the podcast, or now that we're two years into having gotten the rights back and doing more advertising? You know, it, you never really know for sure. It's a it's a tough one, but I I, I do uh, I do know people who have done serialized novels, even though the book is available for purchase, and a lot of people like me. I was like, well, I don't want to wait. I don't yep. want to wait two more weeks for the next chapter. <laughs> I'm just going to buy it because it's not that expensive. right? Yep. <laughs> I'm just going to buy it and then I'm going to enjoy the whole novel. And then I can listen to the podcast episodes and then get the behind the story. So I'm going to get the best of both worlds. I, I well, wonder I, I wonder if that's part of it. I'm, I'm hoping that is because that, you know, the intention was, as, as I said in a recent episode, there's three types of listeners. There's the ones who go immediately to the to where the chapter is. And that's how we always have that as a, you know, you can just easily jump to that if you want. Right. So there's those people, there's people who uh, listen to the whole thing. And then the biggest group are people who don't listen to it at all. And right. that's a huge audience for us. And that's what we're trying to get to is <laughs> people who those people to it who aren't all. listening at all. That's, that's our target right now. So right. So right there, you've revealed some of the humor that's probably uh, in these novels. <laughs> oh yeah. <they're... laughs> yes. That's fantastic. No. So actually that was the question as you started talking about this, I'm like, I'd love to listen to this podcast, but I just want to listen to the audiobooks too. Cause who, who's the narrator? What's the, what's the His name is Jim Cunningham. Jim uh, was one of these people that I met in in the corporate world. He came in to audition for some MC event 35 years ago. And um, he remembers what I said after his audition because the producer turned to me and said, what do you think? And I said, I think we should hire him. I think we should hire him now. I think we should hire him again. And we should keep hiring him until we can't afford to hire him because he was really good. He has a background in improvisation. Uh, he was raised on comedy. His uh, older brother uh, was a magician for years. In fact, he still does occasional shows, so he understands the magic world. Uh, and he just went, he reads for a living. I mean, that's what he does. He goes into a 
booth and reads for a living, whether it's copy for an ad or he uh, sometimes the been the announcer for the Minnesota Twins here mm. and for the wild hockey team. Uh, he does his own magic show. He, he just he because he's a performer who understands humor and understands magic, he is the ideal reader for the books. Oh my God, that's right. He is a, a magician uh, as well, which makes He him... would claim he's not. Yeah. He would say, I'm not a magician yet. As someone who's not a magician, he knows everything about it. He buys tricks all the time right. and he puts on an annual magic show. I think he's a magician. But yeah, so he understands the, the character, right? So totally, that's awesome. totally. Yeah. yeah, where are you going to get that if you just hire someone? <laughs> wow. I know. So I, I have to ask, you talked earlier about... Um, work and the the stuff you did with film and script and screen and stuff like that. And then the fun of writing. Mm -hmm. Where's the fun now? Is it still, is it, is the other, is it becoming too much work? Are you still having fun? Are you having fun in both areas? What's, what's going on now? Um, I'm trying to have fun. I'm retired from the other thing. So technically this is all I really need. Full-time writer now. Uh, full-time uh, novelist, I should say. Well, yeah, I, I like to think full-time retiree who writes. Okay. Um, as as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, uh, the podcast takes up a considerable amount of time. No, yeah, uh, really? <laughs> yeah, really. Um, if it's done uh, nicely, yes. Uh, I'm so glad you edit yours. I There are some podcasts that I just can't listen to anymore because they don't edit or they don't appear to edit. And I don't have three hours. I just don't. Um, and so I want my listeners, our listeners to get everything they need in about an hour. And if they right. put it at one, 1. 1.5, they can get it in 44 minutes, whatever it is. <laughs> so that's a certain amount of my time. Um, and then I'm always trying to write something else, but I'm trying to do it where it's fun. You know, um, I think the first time I heard you was on the six figure authors podcast. Um, and then I went back and listened to a bunch of your stuff and uh I'd like their attitude. Um, there's just, there's people can get so driven doing this where they say, I have to do three books a year and I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. And this is the guy who didn't want a book contract. I mean, and when you say that <laughs> to some writers, to, yeah, that's you said that to some writers, like I turned down a book contract. Like, what? It's like, yeah, because, um, I, I, I know that I have people who love the Eli Marks books and I get emails literally all the time saying, when is the next one coming out? And although I feel a certain obligation to them, um, the books are for me. I'm writing them for me. I'm writing to enjoy the process and to get the story on paper. Cause as it turns out, I like creating stories. I didn't realize that when I was 13, but when you start shooting three minute and 20 second movies. And then all of a sudden you're making features and then you're writing a couple TV things. You go, Oh, I guess I, I, I enjoy the process of figuring this out. Um, the downside for me is I write mysteries and it's very hard for me to come up with a solid mystery. One that I'm happy with right. where I think when the reader reads it, they'll get to the end and go, that was inevitable. And I'm completely surprised. And you were absolutely fair all the way along. Um, that's what I'm aiming for. Cause I don't like it. When I read something where it isn't fair, uh, I don't want to bash Agatha Christie uh, because she's wonderful. But there are times when she just doesn't tell you stuff, just flat out doesn't tell you stuff. And then you get to the end and she goes, and I knew that obviously he, because of his pronunciation, he was from Portugal. And it's like, no, you didn't mention that. You just did not. So <laughs> some of her stuff is obviously better than others, but there are times when she's just sort of churning it out. And I don't want to do that. I want each one to stay and uh, alone and be if that's the only one you read you're very happy having read it and you're very satisfied and because it takes me a while to do it it, it takes me a while to do it could i get up with a gun to my head and and, and write 2500 words a day yeah maybe for a week or so and then i'd probably expire it just doesn't interest me and what i learned uh from making the low budget movies is if you take economics out of it if you take the need to make money out of it um it's so much more fun with the low-budget movies, like the last one I did, uh, we spent about a year shooting it on weekends. I already had the gear. Everyone volunteered their time. I had to pay for lunches and some props. I spent more money uh, entering the finished film into film festivals than I did making the movie. Uh, if, if you're working in that kind of environment, and you certainly can do that with uh, you know, independent writing, uh, you have all the tools. I paid for vellum. I got to spend a few hundred bucks on a cover and an editor and all that, but it's very small investment. I don't need to 
be making six figures a year. In fact, that would probably terrify me a little bit. Um, I'm happy uh, anytime I get an email that says, hey, look, somebody went to your website and they went to your website deal where they can buy all seven books for a really nice low price. Um, bing, that happens. Like, that's really cool. I really like that. Or when you look at the results of the sales in the day, I go, clearly somebody just went, bing, 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 and bought all seven books right in a row. Right. That clearly happened. Or with the filmmaking books where all of a sudden you'll get a notice saying you sold uh, 25 filmmaking books today. Clearly somebody somewhere is using this for a text in a class. And they said, this is a book we're using here, but that's fantastic. Nothing makes me happier than that. Oh, that's fantastic. That is so refreshing to hear. It actually feels <laughs> Joanna Penn and I just uh, just put together yeah. the relaxed author book. And I was like, John, you could have been part of that conversation. Like, hey, let's just relax into this. Let's enjoy the whole thing. Instead, now, it's not you know. easy. It isn't easy. <laughs> no, because, no, it's not. <laughs> um, I'm always, you know, there's two kinds of things I'm trying to learn all the time. One is about uh, writing. So I'm listening to podcasts like yours. And the other is I listen to a lot of magic podcasts, right. uh, which are very unstressful because it's just, you're just absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. You never know what you're going to use from what you've heard. And, but just, you have to have it because I'm supposed to be able to write like a, an actual magician. But the, the ones about writing and, and being an independent, if you get caught up in them, um, you can kind of get into this, uh, you can hyper yourself into a frenzy, as I said, in the big chill, where you go, well, I got to be doing this. I've got, oh, I'm not, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. And the fact is you don't got to, you don't got to do anything. You yeah. could stop writing now and uh, be happy doing something else. It's a beautiful day, I'll go for a walk. Um, that it is actually, it does actually take a little bit of work to keep that mindset in place, to go, this is supposed to be fun and interesting for me. And I don't need to turn it into a competition. Awesome. <laughs> John, I, uh, I know I'm going to be inviting you back because there's so many other things we need to talk about uh, and get caught up on how things are going. But for now, uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me. But please share with my listeners where they can find out more about you, find links to your books, your podcast, et cetera. You know, the easiest thing to do is just go to elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S mysteries. Dot com, uh, and that's where you'll find all the Eli Marks mysteries, and you can find the the link to the podcast there. Um, the filmmaking books, just look and just search for John Gaspard, uh, a fast, cheap film, uh, and you, if you're interested in those. Awesome, and I'll make sure that there are links to all of those things over at StarkReflections.ca for this episode. John, thanks again so much for hanging out with me today. Well, thanks for having me. It was really fun. One of the things that I've long been passionate about sharing with writers is that though we love writing, we love storytelling, that writing is a business. It is a business. Books are a commodity. Publishers are businesses that invest in commodities in order to sell them. It's a different kind of commodity. It's not like food or clothing or, or, or things, right? It's an entertainment commodity, but it's a business, even though we love it and it's fun. And I love, I love that John recognized this. So when he was with this publisher and he realized that, well, maybe, okay, it was great. Uh, things were good. Uh, it's not you, it's me, <laughs> or maybe it's a little bit you, but you know, he, he looked at it and said, okay, I've got these four books and uh, I can do things now that there are indie author opportunities. I know more about the business. And, you know, our heart's not in the game uh, as, as a team. So we need to separate. I need to do this on my own. So he looked at money and came up with a dollar amount and approached them and said, listen, here's what I want to do. Here's, here's, here's some cash. And just like when you think about a contract as a negotiation, the ongoing relationship with a publisher is a negotiation. It's business. And that's what it is. And it's like, okay, the publisher's like, okay, great. This is it. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and again, he's thinking about the decision they're going to make is how much money could we make off these books if we continue to do stuff with them and how much work is it, et cetera. It's probably not much work for them anymore because it's mostly just backlist sales and most publishers only focus on the front list, very rarely go to the backlist. I mean, maybe there's always an increase in your backlist every time a new book comes out. But again, instead of um, 
you know, instead of just, just hoping and wishing and praying that he would get the rights back, he came up with a dollar amount and said, okay, here you go. I'm going to give this to you. I'd like my rights back so I can do stuff with them. And that was bold and, and it was calculating and it was very strategic and, and, and it was a, it was forward thinking because again, I don't know the amount of money, but it could have been like, oh, wow, I have to come up with this cash now and I may not make this money back. Now, now John did say he made his money back almost immediately, but it could have taken years. And that was a risk he was willing to take because he was taking a risk and investing in his own IP, investing back in himself and in his future. I also love the fact that he was writing full time, but it was, you know, work writing as opposed to passion writing. And so there was that. And then, of course, the writing and the creativity that he has done uh, for screenwriting. And then, and I think there's a little bit of that. Um, you know, people who don't write books and people who aren't writers, they think every writer must be rich. Oh, you sold a book and the book, you know, it's like, I don't know, like my books from Dundurn, for example, sell for $25, uh, the paperbacks. And, you know, people must think, wow, you, you had a skid of them at Costco. You sold whatever. You must be a millionaire because you sold so many of those books. And I don't realize that the logistics is you keep a very small percentage of that. But, uh, you know, when, when I first heard uh, he had written some feature films and stuff like that, I was like, oh, my God, feature films. That's exciting. And, and again, if you know anyone who's worked in the industry as well, it's kind of like, yeah, no, nobody's, uh, I mean, <laughs> like like in the in the book community. Not everyone who is an actor, not everyone who's a screenwriter, uh, you know, is is uh, Steven Spielberg or, you know, uh, a major a major actor uh, making uh, bringing in that kind of money and stuff like that. So it's kind of funny. I remember even even early when in, in our conversation before we started recording, and I was talking about the the stuff he did with film. You know, my eyes kind of lit up the, the way people often their eyes light up when they hear, "Oh, you're an author, therefore you must be famous and rich." <laughs> so, uh, it's so cute because, you know, we, we know better as authors and yet I still did it and, and, and I know better. So it was, it was kind of funny. So I find it interesting. Uh, you know, we can understand the business. We can understand all of these logistics. And yet we still, we still fall prey <laughs> to, to some of these misperceptions that we have. Well, that's it for my reflections uh, about this conversation with John uh, Gaspard. If you have any reflections of your own, uh, like I said prior to the interview, please feel free to leave them over uh, for the show notes uh, at starkreflections.ca. Always love to hear what you're thinking of when you uh, finish listening um, to uh, these interviews, these conversations, these reflections. If you would like to support the podcast, you can always uh, join the small but powerful group of patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. And a huge, huge thank you to my patrons. Love you guys. Thank you so much for your support. There's going to be another bonus, uh, some more bonus content coming out within the next couple of weeks as I've queued some things up. And you do not have to be a patron to support this podcast. Listening to this podcast like you're doing right now. Thank you so much. You're listening. That's cool. That's support. You can leave a review, of course, on the podcatcher of your choice. An honest review about the podcast. That never hurts because reviews help, as we know, as authors. Or, better yet, you can even share this podcast with a friend that you think would find value in the interviews, the conversations, the stark reflections. And so, this is the end of episode 218. Until next week in episode 219, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.